thank you all for coming today. This is the Innovation Day Semiconductor Research and Innovation, EU, India and Japan Perspectives. I'm Yudita Rikamajo, country representative for York South Japan, and a very warm welcome to all of you. Good morning to those of you who are in Europe. Good afternoon to our Indian participants and good evening to Japan. This 2023 Innovation Day event will be the first of its kind with an EU-India-Japan dimension. We aim at presenting notable projects and initiatives from all sides in the field in semiconductors, and we hope to cover some of the recent collaboration developments as well. We are very happy to, to join and to contribute in, in a small way that we really I think it's an exciting uh, uh, event format that we have the perspectives not only from EU, Japan, but also India. So this is a very exciting triangle on the subject of semiconductors research and innovation. So we are very happy you know, to, to take part in it uh, and um, looking much forward to this very interesting event with all the presentations which are lined up and especially, of course, a very um, well, good afternoon to those who are joining uh, from India and maybe recognize uh, my face here today. So we're, as I said, we're very happy to, to to be part and looking much forward to today's event. Thank you, Judith, back to you. Thank you for the kind of marks and again for uh, working with us on this event, the EU Japan Center for Industrial Cooperation uh, to Luca Escoffier, who will actually deliver the opening remarks and uh, I'd like to ask him to share the slides, Luca. Absolutely, thank you, Judith, and uh, welcome to all the uh, the guests that we are from uh, across the planet. Give me just one second, and I think I should be able to share my screen. Can you see the screen in full? Yes, it's full a full screen. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you, Judith, uh, for again, once again, working uh, together and mostly you worked on this. So I had to admit that. And I thank you for, for that, for the organization of the of today's event. And also I'm glad to uh, be joined by a lot of uh, other esteemed guests and speakers. So I'm very excited. The topic is super interesting. As we all know, uh, and also I'm glad that we have participants from uh, from the EU, Japan, and India that are today with uh, with us. I know that the uh, the lineup of speakers is super packed. We have a lot of very interesting things to talk about. So I will be short. I just wanted to let you know for those of you that do not know me or the center or the help desk, what we do and how our work can be tangential to what we are going to talk about today. So first off, let's start with the short uh, description of the EU Japan Center for Industrial Cooperation. That is uh, a joint venture between the uh, Japanese government, METI, the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Investment, and the European Commission. It has a long history and uh, with two uh, offices, eight quarters in Tokyo and another office in Brussels, where my other colleagues are currently working. Uh, we do offer mostly services tailored and aimed at SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises. We try to help them with, uh, of course, enhancing their trade capabilities, trying to, of course, enhance, as the name of the center suggests, industrial cooperation, working on innovation projects, uh, in general, trying to educate them as much as we can about the latest trends and news about the different markets that we cover. And we try to do that, of course, delivering services in person and also on online. The um, the mission specifically, uh, to be a little bit more detailed of the of the center, can be, uh, let's say, listed with this set of selected services. They are not all of them, but just a, a selection of the services we can go through this very very quickly. We organize business missions, which means that we literally accompany companies uh, to uh, meet uh, other companies or other potential partners in general during fairs, or we do organize missions uh, ad hoc 
uh, for maybe, for example, visiting venues or factories and, uh, and things like that. We do work as a, a node of the Enterprise Europe network to facilitate together with the colleagues that we have in other around 70 countries across the planet to uh, facilitate connections among SMEs and also research institutions. So we're the only uh, entity that is able to accept requests to join the EEN services from Japan, as well as we are the uh, national contact point of Horizon that, uh, uh, as you all know, is the largest funding source for R&D projects. We also have a specific desk for business cooperation in third markets, free trade agreement help desk for the EPA. And we also offer services for the uh, realization of business plans, of marketing reports. We host companies that are interested in coming to Tokyo, for example, for a visit, for doing some market research. They can be hosted by the center. And uh, we are located in the very uh, center area of Tokyo, so it's pretty convenient. Uh, we host also, of course, interns. We have uh, fellowship programs for professionals that uh, desire to spend six months in Tokyo writing on topics that are either suggested by the applicants or promoted by the center itself. And then we have a series of help desks. We have a tax and public procurement, and we have a regional cooperation and Space Japan and technology transfer help desk that are the two uh, that are managing myself. Uh, today, I will not probably skip the Space Japan Health Desk, but a little bit concentrate on the on the second one, on the uh, technology transfer. So this is a service that was created back in 2016. So now uh, it's uh, around seven years that we are uh, operational with this service and originally uh, was intended to help promote technologies from universities with out licensing opportunities, therefore making available technologies uh, patented, of course, available technologies uh, more visible to the market and especially to an external market from Japan to the EU market, from the EU market to the Japanese market. Then uh, in the years to come, things uh, uh, kind of uh, changed a little bit. And in the, in that sense, uh, I said, I, would, I can say that I also helped companies with open innovation uh, projects in the sense that I help them scout for technologies or um, skills that is very common. So for example, when a, a company is interested in running a project, they might first want to know who is doing what and how good he or she is. And so this is, for example, the beginning of an open innovation project in which you might look first for skills and then uh, leverage those skills to create, for example, new technology. So this is how a little bit the system and the service uh, evolved in these in these years. And uh, as well, I started working a lot with uh, with startups from both regions, and that was also also uh, very uh, entertaining and very uh, helpful, hopefully for for the companies that we helped out. Uh, we do have a website. Actually, the website is under uh, migration. So from next week, probably or in a couple of weeks, you will see that. Uh, part of the major, the main website of the EU Japan Center. So that is the, the big change that is going to happen. As of today, what you can see is a series of technologies that are posted by universities that are free to uh, post for free. Um, the technologies that they have available, uh, usually, of course, patented. So all the information is directly received from universities and then they are uh, they are posted on the, on the website. There are different layers. Uh, if we want to look at the kind of order in which information is being displayed. So we have a first layer of results with the help desk database and the university databases. And the second layer with the information provided by a partner company of the help desk that is based in Belgium called Academic Labs. And then the third layer is provided by institutional websites like WIPOS database or EPO pattern database or the EU radar platform. So the, the difference between all these layers of information and databases is the kind of a status of the technology. So it can be just a technology that is being developed and there is a pattern application pending, or it can be patented, or it can be in the case of, for example, of the EU radar platform is also validated, evaluated, and uh, and also, for example, organized by 
potential applications. So in the case of the EU radio platform, we also know what kind of uh, uh, ESGs are applicable and uh, so they can be used for. Uh, the, the website, the access to the website, of course, is free of charge. So I would uh, ask you to uh, take a look if you are if you're interested. And again, with the uh, caveats that in a couple of weeks, we will uh, migrate to the uh, to the other website. The um, the website is also showing information about the events that we run, like today's webinar. We are organizing seminars uh, regularly. I'm based in Tokyo, so usually the seminars are uh, taking place in Tokyo. We are, um, for example, in a couple of weeks, we will have a web a seminar physically in Tokyo on the unified patent system that, as you may know, has been in place now for a little bit more than six months and also on super interesting topics that go hand by hand with the topic of today, generative AI. We will be talking about the influence and impact of generative AI on intellectual property rights. If you're interested in following us, of course, you can follow the, all the social media accounts that we have, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I also want to conclude in uh, uh, today's uh, presentation by telling you that also my help desk was involved and is involved in missions. So if some of you is uh, interested in participating in future missions that are related to the topics of my help desk, I would invite you to be in touch. This is an example of last December's mission that we had the digital mission at Tokyo ILS. ILS is the uh, largest uh, open innovation event taking place regularly every year in, uh, in Tokyo. So for example, as you can see from these two pictures on the right, we ran a digital mission in December where we helped EU companies uh, with matchmaking opportunities in, uh, in Japan. Uh, as you can see from, uh, from the slides that I showed, uh, they're not directly related to semiconductors, but they're embracing all kinds of technologies, kind of an horizontal uh, service that can cover any kind of technology. So uh, I would be happy to be in touch with you should you have any questions about uh, projects that you may want to uh, start between the EU and Japan and or technologies that you might be interested in in licensing or out licensing between the EU and Japan. And without further ado, I'll just conclude thanking you once again with the last slide with the QR code with my uh, profile if you want to get in touch and of course my email account if you want to send me an email. Thanks again and I wish you all uh, audience and speakers very su successful and fruitful webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luca, for the opening remarks and um, for outlining the services of the EU Japan Center for Industrial Cooperation and also the help desk. Our next speaker is Gianluca Sampaolo, Research Fellow in Applied Economics and Department of Law at the University of Macerata, where he is also a Senior Fellow at the China Center. The title of his presentation is Navigating the Great Powers Competi uh, Competition Through Strategic de-risking of the EU chip ecosystem. Gianluca, if you could please share your slides. Thank you, Judith, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thanks to Eurex's uh, Japan and India and to the EU Japan Center for Industrial Cooperation for inviting me as an early stage researcher and for creating the opportunity to discuss from the perspective of research and innovation such a hot topic nowadays. Uh, again, my name is Gianluca Sampaolo and I am a research fellow in applied economics at the University of Macerata and uh, in Italy and uh, as, as an ologist who has then specialized in geopolitics and you know, applied economics, this interdisciplinary background has allowed me to approach the very uh, complex semiconductor industry which requires a blend of uh, cross-sectoral knowledge and skills. Uh, today, uh, what I'm, I'm, I'm presenting today is the result of previous studies and publication, as well as ongoing research endeavor, which navigates through the context on which the European Union uh, strategies, strategic de-risking uh, for the European chip ecosystem is based upon. Uh, so as to start, we <clears throat> all know that technological innovation is contingent upon semiconductor devices, which are critical components for many industries and 
as well, these technologies and the economies of the future, such as artificial intelligence, cloud accelerators, and uh, high performance computing platforms, amongst other. Uh, although historically a stage for political maneuvering, it is relative recent developments that actors like the United States, China, and the European Union have engaged in a power competition within this industry that is today at the center of strong geostrategic interests and at the core of the global technological race where innovation capacity of states is at stake. In fact, recent global dynamics and geopolitical tensions have prompted more assertive policy and legislative uh, interventions uh, specifically targeting the global value chains of chips. And according to uh, the graph, this is challenging what can be called techno-globalism, decades of globalization and tech developments that have led to the global integrations of <clears throat> economic relationships uh, in, in favor of a counter movement which is now taking place, techno-nationalism, where technological developments are increasingly protected and linked to uh, national security and interests. Uh, indeed, we are talking about one of the most complex uh, industry and related value chain uh, in terms of dependencies and interconnection and the, the very supply chain, which uh, starting from the uh, mining, the refining and supply of critical raw materials and stretching through the chip design, front end, the back end processes before reaching end user companies is it is highly characterized by long fabrication cycle times, high levels of stochasticity, and non linearity in the manufacturing process. Moreover, the high volatility of the electronic market makes for an unpredictable uh, demand. Whereas globalization, led to more complex process and organizational uh, weight. Whereas globalization has pushed companies worldwide to relocate uh, manufacturing to low-cost countries, resulting in a, a competitive price for customers, it also led to more complex processes and organizational structures uh, that uh, increased uh, the customization, the diversification and spe specialization of the design complexity of products and correspondingly the uh, supply organization are evolved from from linear supply chains into broader and more complex supply networks and the supply chain of chips is uh, exactly the case with no is, is well integrated with no leading country dominating each stage of the value chain resulting in a quite concentrated and unbalanced geography, where we can see core intellectual property associated with designing semiconductors concentrated in the United States, Korea, South Korea, Taiwan, and some European locations, while much of the production assembly and testing of products takes place in Asia and particularly in China. And as a matter of fact, most of the foundry activity is located in Taiwan and uh, China. Uh, the intricacy of the very same industry and related uh, uh, value and supply chain is visible in the figures in, in, this, uh, in this slide, which are the preliminary results of an ongoing research I am conducting with my supervisors, my colleagues at uh, the University of Macerata, where by performing an economic and social network analysis, we are investigating the worldwide network of export and imports of uh, integrated circuits, a type of semiconductor devices, measured by the averaging degree of the monetary value of for import on your left-hand side and of export on your uh, right-hand side. As you can see, another uh, an important aspect to be highlighted is the fact that, that, it, that there is a huge role played by uh, Asian and Asian manufacturers and uh, a case in point and a powerful competitor is uh, uh, China that has been increasingly using industrial policies to establish presence in almost every steps of 
uh, chip making thanks to huge investment and uh, development throughout the years and the more recent uh, in that state-led industrial policy made in China 2025 and the policies to promote high quality growth in uh, integrated circuits and software industries. However, not enough. And with the tensions with the United States that are increasing, it was safe to assume that China would have doubled down on its path to indigenous development. And this is certainly demonstrate, demonstrated in the 14 five-year plan and in the law on science and technology progress, which aims, amongst other, to strengthen those priority areas identified in the 14 five-year plan, including but not limited to uh, ICs and to integrated circuits. Uh, finally, the increased prospect for uh, added, added capacity of chips manufacturing on metal process nodes uh, ultimately challenged the United States global technological uh, leadership. Accordingly, the United States has promptly and assertively taken steps both to reduce the uh, dependency and the reliance on chips made uh, in China through the establishment of the Chips and Science Act and to mark a technological containment policy uh, via export restriction, but also putting pressure on allies to align with such endeavor. And the summary is that uh, the US is trying at least to forcefully decoupling the entire advanced technology supply chain before China uh, insources it. However, given the latest tech news from, uh, from China, the results can be questioned. In this context, what has been defined by Chris Miller as the current cheap war coupled with the COVID-19 pandemic and the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, exposed the, the risk that highly concentrated supply chain can pose to the functioning of the European societies economies and as well as a direct challenge to the EU's innovation capacity. The EU faces particular challenges in comparison with its global competitors for technologies in the digital ecosystem, such as uh, clouds and uh, microelectronics. And despite its strong global position in materials and equipment manufacturing, the union is heavily dependent on third country suppliers for the entire processes of the value chain. The current supply crisis that caused a multiple shortage across multiple uh, economic sector with potential uh, serious societal, societal consequences is a, a symptom and uh, of permanent and structural deficiencies, deficiencies in the union's uh, cheap value and supply chain, where anxiety and growing pressure from such dependencies further exacerba exacerbated by the extremely high uh, barriers to entry and capital intensity of the sector directly challenged the prospect of the European Union to develop its own uh, ecosystem, which is decisive for accomplishing the twin digital and green transition, namely through the path to the digital decade and the green industrial plan, the Green Deal industrial plan and the associated transformation of the EU economies, industries and uh, society. As a consequence, the language of the risking from countries of concern has gained currency and started to resonate in Western capitals after a speech of uh, European Commission President von der Leyen in uh, March 2023. Uh, it is safe to say, to argue that enhancing the supply, the security of supply, the resilience and the technological sovereignty in the fields of chips is of paramount importance to effectively the risk and is transversal to deliver on the EU policy priorities. Notably, at the Hiroshima summit uh, in May, last May, the leaders of the G7 nations adopted the the risking not decoupling approach to China. Uh, and the, the underlying rhetoric from this ship from decoupling to the risking reveals a simple observation. For many countries, the cost of decoupling from China is unbearably high. Uh, however, the European Commission has even earlier adopted uh, 
a more strategic stance toward China with Europe wanting to be a trading partner on the one end, but also guarding its strategic interest on the other. And while aiming at preserving the transatlantic alliance with the United States and seeing China as alternatively as a partner, a competitor or a systemic rival, Europe does need to build its own agency in terms of chips, security and development. Accordingly, the need for reducing such external dependencies and vulnerabilities is now addressed in the European, the recently issued uh, European Economic Security Strategy, which represents a comprehensive strategic approach to economic security, uh, to the risking, and to promote the European technological edge in critical sector. It builds upon existing EU efforts to enhance resilience and competitiveness and strengthen the uh, EU European Union open strategic autonomy. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, key actions in this direction are increased investment in the green and digital transition, namely through the uh, next generation EU, and in key pillars of the EU industrial policy, which, which are the critical raw materials act and the net zero industry act. In this context, and in a recent development, uh, the Council of the uh, EU approved, approved the European Ships Act, which constitute the regulatory framework in order to both the risk and enhance the EU chip ec ecosystem. And while reaffirming the, the objective already set out by the 20, 2030 policy program path to <clears throat> the digital uh, decade uh, to increase uh, by 20% the uh, EU shares in global production of cutting edge semiconductors by 2030 uh, is uh, an attempt, a European attempt to reduce the vulnerabilities and dependence on foreign actors while also reinforcing the EU industrial base for chips. Supported by the CHIPS joint undertaking, uh, the European CHIPS Act includes a series of measures aimed at ensuring the security of chip supply and promoting, most importantly, research and development of innovative technologies in the sector. Getting to the conclusion, uh, supporting the EU chip ecosystem is thus of paramount importance to ensure uh, the, the, the security of supply and enhance thus the uh, economic competitiveness in the, the EU. However, what a, a question that must be asked at the European uh, at the European Union level is what is necessary to effectively the risking and the risk the EU, EU, EU chip ecosystem. From the research perspective, uh, first of all, it is necessary to analyze the, the, the risk and the inherent tension that exists between bolstering economic security, but also ensuring that the EU continues to benefit from uh, an open economy. Uh, second, the international cooperation with third countries, and here it comes the importance of building bilateral relations as we recently seen between the EU and Japan, uh, is an important element to achieve uh, the resilience in the union ships ecosystem and enable the union to play a stronger role as a center of excellence and research excellence in a better functioning uh, semiconductor ecosystem at the global level. Third, a comprehensive analysis of the underlying drivers of uh, uh, and geopolitics of the risking is badly needed. Uh, and this is, connects us to the possibility to reduce the supply dependencies, which is the fourth point of discussion uh, that requires the understanding of the complexity of the very same value chain, the in-depth, the more in-depth analysis and monitoring of the uh, risk associated with each stage of the, of the value chain. Fifth, reliance on international trade is a, is not, is not, it must not be treated as a vulnerability, but rather helps to, uh, to sustain diversified 
supply and demand that ultimately enable positive and amplifying aspect uh, effects on the sustainable developments of other EU industrial uh, sectors, depending on chips. Sixth, to develop its own uh, agency, the EU must seek to develop uh, geopolitical leverage by investing in and cultivating those choke points that are equally indispensable to the global value chain of chips, so equipment and the supply of chemicals and components. And components, yes. Seventh, last but not least in terms of importance, investing in human capital, particularly through upskilling the European workforce, plays a pivotal role in achieving the priorities outlined in the European Economic Security Strategy. Whereas pillar one of the European Chips Act will support a network of competent centers based on the excellence of the European research across the all regions, uh, and whereas EU-funded initiatives are on the way to address the skills and talent gap in the STEM domain, uh, which means the microelectronics and highly technical skills with regards to the METIS project and with regards to high-performance computing with the Euro CC Access project, there is a need, a bad, a, 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 an important need to address also the impact of geopolitics on strategic industries and related global value chain, but also the other way around. So there is the need to understand the hows and why behind uh, strategic industries and global value chains making the case for geopolitical tension. And this will enable the capacity to anticipate future crisis and providing timely policy guidance and industry recommendation. That's all for my presentation. I thank you for your attention and be glad to answer any question you may have. Thank you so much, uh, Gianluca. A very informative presentation about the EU CHIP Act and the strategy of uh, how to de-risk um, the uh, situation for Europe. So we would like to continue with the next presentation from India and listen to the perspective that uh, Professor Svaru Ganguly would like to outline. He is joining us from IIT Bombay Research Park and will discuss semiconductors and uh, what we can do together. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I think the stage has been very well set uh, by our colleagues from Uraxis and Professor Gianluca. So, um, uh, the topic that I set for myself is to talk about semiconductors and what together we can do. This is a quote from a very famous speech, which was uh, John F. Kennedy's uh, inaugural address as uh, president. And he asked uh, fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. Of course, I want to talk about what together uh, we can do for uh, in the field of uh, semiconductors. And uh, America came up in uh, the earlier talk. It will come up again in mine, uh, but I will try to talk about what uh, maybe between the EU, Japan, uh, and India we could be doing. Uh, my name is Swaroop Ganguly. I'm with the Department of Electrical Engineering at IIT Bombay, and I lead the IIT Bombay Research Park at this time. I'm professor in charge. This is IIT Bombay's inter window to industry. I'm going to talk about that. Uh, towards the end of uh, end of this. So um, not really to uh, talk about my bio, but um, I wanted to share this. I went from uh, college education in the in India to the US, uh, Austin, where I schooled and worked in the US semiconductor industry, then went to a Japanese company in the US, which sent me to uh, Europe to work at a very interesting place called IMEC, which is a major star in the semiconductor firmament of the world. Uh, it is a place where semiconductor companies go to get their initial technology development done. So my employer, Dell, Tokyo Electron, uh, Japanese company had sent me to Belgium. So this is the point where you know I kind of uh, encompassed India Europe and uh, Japan. That's why I wanted to just show this. Moving on, 
Uh, over the last, I'll, I, I want to talk about um, semiconductors in India, which may come as a surprise to some of you because uh, it's not there uh, on the map really when you look at you know, the semiconductor economy of the world. India doesn't have a, much of a semiconductor economy today. Uh, but, uh, but India has been uh, slowly and steadily developing talent in its universities. And I have been a part of that. Uh, I was attracted back to India because the Indian government was setting up semiconductor, uh, major semiconductor facilities, which are quite world class. Let me quickly take you through that. Over the last few years, I have been leading the IIT Bombay Nano Fabrication Lab. And I want to share with you what all we do here. This lab, incidentally, is uh, one of the two oldest and still largest such labs in India for comprehensive uh, semiconductor device fabrication along with our partners at IAC. And uh, being in that position, we tend to get famous visitors sometimes. This was Mr. Biden back in 2000 13 inside our fab lab. Um, in terms of what we do, uh, we do a lot of research with industry, mostly you will see global semiconductor industry, and most of them are American, as you will see here. Uh, maybe we'll change that. Uh, we also do a lot of work with, of course, there isn't much of an Indian semiconductor industry yet. We have been working with uh, key agencies like our space agency for their small volume semiconductor needs. Uh, in terms of our research, we have been, so we have been developing technologies, critical technologies like uh, gallium nitride for uh, radio frequency uh, communications and radar. This technology is transferred to our space agency. We are developing semiconductor based uh, quantum sensors uh, and many other types of devices. We are working with some of the uh, largest and most well-known semiconductor companies. This is Applied Materials highlighting their research, collaborative research with IIT Bombay. Uh, we have been pioneers in industrial training because uh, as we see the semiconductor industry leaders talk about the trillion dollar opportunity, in the same breath they talk about the talent bottleneck. And we being in India and one of the premier institutes in India feel that we can uh, develop talent not only for India but for the world and we take that seriously. Uh, lastly, uh, we are very keen on not only working with industry but also providing a path for you know our research and our innovation to go into startups of our own so that that happens in a, in a big way. Uh, and lastly, I want to talk about some a program we run called the Indian Nano Electronics Users Program. Uh, so with some major foresight from the Indian government, they had said that this world-class uh, semiconductor facility that they were paying us to build, they, they wanted it to be a national open facility, open to the whole nation. And we have done that. Uh, you can see the numbers here, P, uh, 400 PhD students and over 500 publications. These are not IIT Bombay. These are from the rest of the country. So I'll uh, move on. This is about that program in a little bit of <clears throat> detail. I don't really want to take you through uh, a lot of this detail. I'll just say that there are multiple levels of training that we provide, the highest being where a research project, a PhD project actually gets executed from any university in the country using our facility. Uh, and in the most recent uh, version of this program, we have been asked to start supporting not only uh, academic users, but also startups, and we are doing that in a very robust way. Uh, very importantly, I want to point out and also maybe clarify that uh, in front of you today, I don't really consider myself to be speaking uh, only for IIT Bombay, but for uh, the Indian semiconductor ecosystem. This program that I'm telling you about is actually run as a network from all these Indian institutes uh, that's IIT Bombay, IISC, IIT Madras, IIT Kharagpur, IIT Madras, and IIT Bawati. Together, we run this program as a network. Um, the other thing that we do, besides training people and our own research, is to provide um, high-quality policy inputs to the Indian government. Uh, I was part of a detailed planning that was provided, uh, that was done for the Indian government. So the principal scientific advisor to the government of India had commissioned IIT Bombay to do this study. 
about a semiconductor R&D center similar to uh, what you have in, in Belgium, IMEC, uh, which is a very enabling kind of place sitting between academic research and uh, manufacturing and enabling that link. Uh, and many of the inputs that we gave here made it into India's semiconductor mission uh, policies. And as you may know, this uh, policy is starting to slowly but surely bear fruit in terms of uh, credible players announcing plans for semiconductor related manufacturing in India. I'm saying semiconductor related because these are not chip fabrication yet. These are uh, packaging. But as you also know, uh, East Asia, where which is the epicenter of chip fabrication today, started with uh, packaging. It's a, it's we we think that it's a uh, it's a lower hanging fruit, which is a great place to start. So this is, in a nutshell, the India Semiconductor Mission Opportunity. Uh, this is the amount of funding that is promised to companies that are setting up uh, these manufacturing uh, operations. Uh, these are given as upfront grants, so the government is, is uh, unprecedented in the amount of uh, help that it wants to give to the private sector now. And in addition, and in line with what we had proposed, a major national research center is, is also planned for semiconductors. Uh, and this is how, uh, just to sort of uh, zoom into uh, IIT Bombay for a minute, this is how IIT Bombay responded to whatever was happening in terms of the uh, semiconductor ecosystem worldwide and in India. So we felt that it was very important for ourselves and from, from the interest, uh, from the perspective of, of India, to uh, integrate all our semiconductor activities under, under one umbrella. As the previous speaker was saying, there are things like uh, uh, materials, chemicals, right, equipment, all of those things are essential parts of the ecosystem and we, cannot, we must think of all of these in a very holistic way. So here is uh, our thought on about this Center for Semiconductor Technologies, which we have called SEMIX, SEMI for semiconductors and X for everything related to semiconductors. You can see here materials, uh, equipment, packaging, technology, uh, design and systems. Of course, our goal is to uh, work with government and industry, uh, bring these three together in a more robust way than perhaps has been done before. And as I said, we consider this to be very multidisciplinary. So uh, there are 50, close to 50 faculty members across IIT Bombay from various departments who are a part of this initiative. Uh, these are the uh, sort of action verticals that we have, research and training our bread and butter. We are getting more into entrepreneurship every day. And finally, you know, uh, policy inputs to the government, which I talked about. We feel it is, it is quite important uh, for, for India particularly. Uh, I want to talk about the industry research engagement that we have had, uh, again, because there aren't, there isn't an Indian semiconductor industry, but uh, at IIT Bombay in particular, we have been fairly successful in working with uh, global giants, the likes of Applied Materials, Synopsys, Intel, all of them have partnered with us on R&D. Here are uh, a couple of examples. Uh, there's just a few. Indian entities that are now making their headway with whom we are working. And here I have uh, tried to mark out uh, uh, the European entities that we have uh, worked with. And there's a very large Japanese company with whom we hope to get started uh, next year. Uh, I wanted to sort of underline that most of the names here are uh, US based. So going back to the semiconductor mission and the responses to the semiconductor mission from the industry there was this one applied materials you all know this is the largest semiconductor equipment or second largest equipment company in the world they are uh, one of the largest investors in the indian ecosystem building up a collaborative engineering center the deal is to create a whole distributed ecosystem in india around themselves so we find when we look for you know what are win-win opportunities i think applied materials has uh, been a pioneer in in showing the way about what can be win-win opportunities uh, the chemical industry in india right for instance uh, there's they see a lot of opportunity now in in working with uh, 
AMATS engineering center to make themselves ready for the semiconductor industry. So I want to take a, a minute to uh, take you through our journey, the IIT Bombay journey with applied materials. It is a 18-year-old uh, journey starting in 2000 or 16-year-old uh, journey starting in 2007 with a very large donation of semiconductor fabrication tools. A few staff engineers from applied materials in that lab and uh, several million dollars of research projects. Uh, there was another lab they started diversifying into uh, chemicals and precursors for semiconductor equipment and uh, more funding. Uh, in 2012, Applied Materials started its own exploration center, their own lab on our campus, which today has some 50 plus staff members. So Applied Materials in Mumbai is inside IIT Bombay. Uh, they are, as of 2016, they were the anchor client and even today the largest members of our IIT Bombay. Uh, research park. Uh, starting 2012 for a few years when well, it was the last time it looked like India was plunging into semiconductors, we got together with applied materials to start a semiconductor manufacturing course for uh, workforce development. It was big enough that uh, it was highlighted in the uh, newsletter of the Ministry of Electronics for the Government of India. However, that initiative kind of fizzled out, but now with the semiconductor mission again in place, we have started again, not just with applied materials, but with other industry as well. This was the last time we run, ran this course earlier this year. Uh, this is us from IIT Bombay, applied materials, global foundries, and we are also trying to bring in uh, potential Indian players like Reliance Industries. So Applied Materials has now joined as a key partner of our semiconductor center and it has, uh, we, we have jointly restarted the course uh, that we had designed earlier. So with that, I'll change gear a little bit. And uh, with that sort of success story of how a foreign company works uh, with Indian academia and extract the best value out of Indian academia, I want to quickly take you through this new initiative about doing this much more efficiently, doing industry academia engagement much more efficiently. Uh, so research park at IIT Bombay, and there are research parks now at most IITs and ISC. So again, I'm talking about uh, IIT Bombay as an example, uh, not uh, limited to, not limiting the scope to IIT Bombay. So uh, the idea here, uh, this is a perfect example of the triple helix government seeding the formation of a bridge between industry and academia in the form of the research park. And we are designing the research park at IIT Bombay and at other places to be a single window where the industry lands when they come to campus. We do hand holding and single window services that make it, that improves the ease of doing business with uh, an IIT for the industry. So this map, if you see here, is all the different kinds of activities that uh, industry engages with, uh, with academia. And the research park has the goal of being the single window to facilitate engagement across all of these modes. Uh, how do we do that? Um, there is real estate, half a million square foot of building, which we want to give out to industry to set up their labs and offices. And after COVID, we also created a virtual engagement platform for industry and uh, IIT Bombay in this case, to be engaged in a, in a continuous daily conversation about what is the next engagement to take up. Uh, with that, I'll move on to the member companies that the IIT Bombay Research Park has today. I have particularly highlighted Japanese and French companies. Murata is a big discrete electronics company. Ubisoft is a big French uh, gaming company. Uh, NTT does electronics and cloud infrastructure. Deutsche Bank perhaps needs, needs no introduction. Uh, more companies. I wanted to take one minute to talk about uh, this very special member that we have and then uh, kind of end with that. NIDO is a body of the Japanese Ministry of uh, Economy, Trade and Industry. And they have joined us, the IT Bombay Research Park as a, a virtual member so that we can partner and reach out to Japanese industry as a whole. We did a workshop with them. We are planning an outreach in Japan together with NIDO uh, for the Japanese industry as a whole. And we are uh, 
so this was our pilot and the next thing we did was uh, the French consulate and embassy reached out and, and we are trying to do the same thing with the Indo-French Chamber of Commerce here. So to summarize what together we can do, um, uh, I have talked a lot about the Americans, uh, but I have left them out of here. They have, they have shown us some good examples. And what the learning for me is that uh, industry uh, have to think beyond India as a market or even India as a manufacturing hub to India as a development partner. Of course, I understand that the opportunities have to be win-win. Is it, you know, our uh, packaging that we can do at a, at a, at a cost leverage? Is it uh, that our chemical industry can uh, sort of uh, retool itself to be valuable to the semiconductor uh, players? So things like that are to be explored. And which means that industry academia strategic partnerships have to be built in, have to be built because we are the ones who are doing this integration. And this is not something that has to be sold to uh, EU industry in the EU. We are already working very closely with the EU universities, similar in Japan and the US. But if we are to have a real partnership, then EU industry and Japanese industry have to understand that they have to build strategic partnerships with, with Indian academia as well. So with that, I will end and thank you very much. Thank you for the very extensive explanation. Uh, let me just uh, uh, chime in to say that uh, we actually participated in a flagship IMAC event here in Tokyo last week with uh, our colleague uh, Luca Escofier and uh, closely follow collaborative initiatives. Uh, in case uh, somebody would like to have more information uh, about such projects, Again, the EU-Japan Center uh, for Industrial Collaboration Cooperation is the, the best to contact in this regard. Thank you very much for the presentation one more time and let us uh, follow with a message from Japan. Our next speaker is uh, Professor Akira Uedono from the Faculty of Pure and Applied Science at the University of Tsukuba. The title of his presentation is Japanese Semiconductor Revitalization Strategy and Universities. He will be joining us via a video recording while participating in the Q&A in real time. I would like to ask my colleague to play the video. Thank you. So thank you very much for introduction. And it's my pleasure to talk about our semiconductor strategy in the Innovation Day. So in this talk, I'm going to present Semiconductor Revitalization Strategy by METI, Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry. And I'm going to talk about uh, its project framework. And also I'll mention the role of university in the strategy. And finally, I'll make a brief conclusion. But uh, first, let me introduce myself. My major research field is material science and solid state physics. My major research tool is a positron annihilation spectroscopy. A positron is an antiparticle of electron and it's powerful tool to study atomic arrangements in solids. Well, it is well known that the fabrication of modern semiconductor devices require full control of behavior of atoms. So positron annihilation is very useful to study device materials, and that is why I am working with semiconductor researchers. For example, I'm working with several uh, semiconductor research organizations such as RETI, IMEC, and SUNY IBM. So this is why I know the trend of semiconductor device. So let me start from semiconductor strategy shown by METI 2021. It is more than 100 page report, but on the first page we found that the basic understanding of the present situation by Japanese government. First one, the semiconductors are the important foundation to support digital societies such as 5G, big data, artificial intelligence, IoT, automated driving, robotics, smart cities, and DX. They are strategic 
technology of vital importance, directly linked to national security. Uh, I am sure that uh, everyone thinks that uh, this is a very nice to hear. Uh, our government finally understands its importance, but unfortunately, we think it's too late. But, so let me show you why we think it's too late. So this view graph shows the trends and forecast for the global semiconductor market. The red bar here shows the Japanese product sales and uh, its share is here. Although the Japan sales is almost constant, but uh, unfortunately the, its share is rap decreased rapidly, suggesting that uh, Japan cannot follow the market growth. Uh, by the way, how about Europe? Here is Japan and here is the EU. So uh, it seems that the share of Japan is not so much different from that of Europe. So we could be a good friend. So anyway, the situation is definitely no good. So this is why METI made the strategy. So semiconductor revitalization strategy consisting of three steps. First step, enhancement of basic production capacity for IoT. Step two, realization of next generation semiconductor technology through Japan-United States co collaboration. Step three, future technology infrastructure through global collaboration. Now, let me explain one by one. So, step one. So, enhancement of basic production capacity for IoT. Uh, I think I don't have to explain this in detail because information about thi this kind of the issue have been broadcasted widely. And uh, the latest news is this. The TSMC plan to produce 6 nanometer in second Japan plant. Also, it is not fully confirmed, but uh, it must be a very good news for us. Step two, realization of next generation semiconductor technology through Japan-United States collaboration. The two countries intended that the bilateral semiconductor supply chain cooperation be guided by following basic principles. Uh, free trade, strengthen supply chain, strengthening semiconductor production capacity, and enhancing R&D cooperation. Well, they are very, very nice, I think. Step three, future technology infrastructure through global collaboration. This is very, very important for us. So let me explain in detail. The major players are Rapidus and the Leading Edge Technology Center, LSTC. Rapidus is a company for mass production of a device, and its fab will be set up Hokkaido here. This is an image of the Rapidus fab. Uh, it looks uh, very, very beautiful, but the fact I am very much interested in its rooftop here. It looks a uh, very nice golf course. Probably the fab workers can go to rooftop and enjoy golf after five. So it must be very nice working circumstance, I guess. So let me explain the relationship between Rapidus and LSTC. The role of Rapidus is a mass production of N2 device. LSTC is a research center of Rapidus for not only N2 device, but also beyond N2 technology node device. 
and the LSTC is a consortium of several universities and national research laboratories. For example, Hokkaido University, Tohoku University, Tsukuba University is my university, and uh, also national laboratories such as AIST, National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology, one of the largest national research center in Japan, and NIMS, NIMS, National Institute of Material Science. The pilot line of Rapidus will be set up at AIST and NIMS, and they locate at Tsukuba City. So I might be able to say that the Tsukuba City will be the one of the centers of the semiconductor research in Japan. And the LSTC will collaborate with overseas research facilities such as IBM, IMEC, etc., and also co collaborate with domestic semiconductor industries, of course. Uh, but the partner of Rapidus is not only Europe, but also India. According to X, Mr. Banishao, Minister of Electronics and Information Technology, Mr. Nishimura, Minister of METI, and Mr. Koike, President of Rapidus, agreed the Japan-India Semiconductor Supply Chain Partnership. It seems that the Indian semiconductor researchers will join Rapidus and help us. And Japan cooperates the rays of the semiconductor industry in India. So this is a very good situation for Japan, EU, and also India. And this is a schedule for next generation semiconductor research and development project. We are now in the process development for mass production stage for N2 and go into the mass production at the later half of the 2020. Well, a lot of discussion was done for this schedule. Uh, some people say it's very difficult or it must be adventure, but uh, because of the time limitation of this uh, presentation, I think I can skip those issues. So what I want to say this. So universities uh, collaborate R&D of N2 and beyond N2 semiconductor technology according to Japanese semiconductor strategy. But we have a lot of problem for that. Here are the two major challenges for us. First one, extremely high cost of publication and test tools of modern devices, plus high maintenance costs of clean room cause the serious difficulty of semiconductor research in university and cause the decrease in the number of the professors who study semiconductors in university. Second, education and the talent cultivation. They are actually a major role and uh, it could be our duty, but it's unfortunately very difficult. The number of the researchers te uh, teaching staff for semiconductor research is very, very limited at this stage. And uh, because of the long time suppression of semiconductor industries, it seems that the young people not only young people, but older people are not so much interested in this field. So I have heard that the situation is not so much uh, different from that in Europe. So let me show you my idea to challenge these issues. This is an international industry university cooperation. So close collaboration between universities, industries, and national research facilities for not only semiconductor research, but also human resource development in semiconductor field. Then we might be able to handle cost manpower issues and we could attract many people to the semiconductor field. And the international collaboration of all of them could cultivate high-quality R&D talent 
who has their own international research network. So in my opinion, because semiconductor devices are made by global supply chain, so young talents must have their own international human resource network. They can uh, then they can further develop this field and we must cultivate such people. Of course, the support from governments greatly help us to catch up the needs of industries and the speed of research for new devices. Now let me conclude my talk. So I am going to refer the words of Peter Wenick, president of ASML. He said, there is no innovation without semiconductor. There is no national security without semiconductor. Well, I could not agree more. So this is why we must pursue semiconductor technology in university. And I hope EU, India, and Japan work together for not only production of semiconductor device, but also cultivate semiconductor R&D talents for our future. Thank you very much. Thank you for the very extensive presentation and uh, the very constructive uh, initiatives with regard to taking care of personal problems and uh, uh, attracting researchers to the semiconductor field, and also for the suggestions on how to further collaboration between the EU, Japan, and India. Uh, the professor has also uh, referred to Tohoku University, and in fact, our next speaker hails from there. Professor Takahiro Shinada is from the Center for Innovative Integrated Electronic Systems. It's one of the most uh, prestigious uh, research labs in Japan, and uh, he will talk about the CIES, this center's overview of uh, uh, overview and spintronics low power semiconductors. So, Professor, if you could please share your slides. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, let me share my presentation slide. Uh, uh, thank you again for providing me the opportunity to deliver my talk. I'm Takahiro Shinada, Tohoku University, and the Deputy Director of the Center in charge of the research prime. Uh, what I'd like to talk about today is to activity of uh, CIS and uh, Spintronics Ropa Semiconductors, uh, which is now a core technology. Uh, through this uh, my presentation, I'd be very happy to if you could share the future based on the technology and future networking and the future creation of innovation together. Uh, <clears throat> first, uh, uh, here is what uh, we are aiming for. Uh, since the uh, uh, establishment of Tohoku University and the principle of the open doors and research first and practical study, uh, Tohoku University has made it uh, a mission to create the world's highest standard of research and education. Uh, under this mission, uh, NAWA Center has uh, defined uh, NAWA research area as a semiconductor integrated circuit and uh, their system is working to the develop the human resources through the R&D activity and industry academia co-creation. Uh, As now a social mission, uh, we aim to contribute to carbon neutrality and social uh, lead, lead a social uh, change by digital shift and uh, uh, contribute to national security. What does our future look like? Uh, the metaverse, uh, edge computing, um, virtual reality, and autonomous driving are uh, envisioned. The technology required to achieve these goals is advanced semiconductors, and we uh, understand that without semiconductors, uh, there would be no future as well as the present. Uh, this is a look back uh, at the performance of uh, uh, performance required for computing using uh, AI as an example. 
as you know, AI need uh, to be trained on the past data and require to computing huge amount of data, as you may know. And recent years, the social implementation of AI has progressed. And uh, last year, generative AI uh, came into the real world. As a result, uh, we uh, move we move far from uh, beyond the traditional technology and the order of magnitude uh, higher computing performance it requires, as shown here. Improvements in performance uh, are likely possible uh, through the improvement of existing technology. However, the problem is that the power is strongly required to uh, learn uh, the computer and the heat generated by, generated by the power consumption are a great issue. <coughs> New game change technology are required to reduce uh, power consumption and associated uh, heat generation. What kind of uh, uh, world would wait us if uh, we could reduce uh, power consumption to one over 100? For example, a uh, smartphone. Uh, I'm sure uh, you all have a smartphone, and, but uh, you have to charge it every day. I would say if the power consumption used to uh, one over 100 and would, uh, you uh, only need to uh, charge it once uh, several months, several few months probably, which will be more convenient and uh, uh, it will be greatly contribute to um, energy saving and carbon neutrality. So introduce, uh, my introduction a little bit long, sorry, uh, but uh, I would like to introduce the center. The Center for Innovative Integrated Electric Systems, CIES, has uh, the technology, of course, and the R&D environment and the structure and the system to meet this need and has been operating a CIES consortium. It has been over 10 years since the center was established and has uh, we have three strengths. Uh, first one is, uh, of course, the core technology. The second is hardware. The third is software. Uh, we have a core technology of spintronics semiconductor, low power semiconductor. With that core technology, I believe we are unable to create and share the future. The core technology let us create a partnership that help us achieve the goal. The second is we have a R&D environment with 300 milliwafer processing and characterization facility. I believe it is only university uh, in Japan, and only uh, one in the world for spintronics integrated uh, semiconductors. The fe this feature uh, is that uh, can be connected to uh, five of advanced semiconductor company. A third one is a system that enables uh, IP management and which is essential for industry, uh, academia joint research, and the contract and meet the world standards. As a result, I understand uh, approx approximately 18, 80, 80 companies are currently participate in the CIS consortium. So let me explain our technical strengths uh, in more detail. Uh, university might oh, usually uh, uh, focus and conduct uh, specialized research activities such as material research, uh, device research, and circuit research individually. On the other hand, we are uh, uh, building a technology value chain to conduct an R&D demonstration from uh, the circuit design, uh, material device, manufacturing, and the characterization, and the system. We understand that this uh, motivated world 
wide variety of uh, domestic and foreign uh, companies joining the CIS consortium. We believe <coughs> as semicon uh, spin tonic semiconductor can be a, a, a game changer. Let me briefly explain uh, what is a spin tonic is. Spin tonics is. Spin tonics is a word and combined with uh, spin and uh, electronics. I would say that is a semiconductor that uh, uh, utilizes the property of magnets. As you may know, this uh, uh, the spin tonics technology was uh, uh, pioneered the present Hideo Ono of Tohoku University and uh, basic uh, uh, structure of uh, spin tonics has invented by uh, Professor Ikeda, uh, the deputy director uh, in charge of the R&D of this center. And uh, Professor Endo, uh, the director of this center, and elevate integration and the circuit technology and uh, brought it to the practical use. As you might know, the conventional semiconductor use the property of uh, electricity, electricity, information stored by the holding uh, charge. <coughs> However, uh, charge <coughs> is gradually lost. And so electricity must be continuously supplied, always supplied. This causes an increase in the power consumption. In fact, uh, this is why you need to charge your cell phone uh, every day, even if then uh, turned off. In contrast, uh, spin tonic semiconductors are not uh, do the information even when the electricity is turned off because it's a magnet. We recognize this technology is expected to be a game-changing technology that will greatly contribute to the energy saving as well as uh, uh, carbon neutrality. I'd like to introduce now our accomplishment in integrated circuit using a spin tonic semiconductor that we have developed. We introduced, uh, produced a prototype of a, a chip at the integrated circuit level, including an AI processor, a microprocessor, uh, 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 next generation uh, memory and uh, high speed memory, so on. We believe spin uh, uh, semiconductor technology is the only technology that can reduce the power consumption uh, to 1 over 100. <clears throat> uh, we believe uh, this uh, uh, low power semiconductor are not limited to application on the ground. In recent year, uh, private business in outer space uh, has uh, just begun, led by uh, typically a SpaceX Corporation, for example. <laughs> Semiconductor are essential for launching and controlling, operating, and rocket. Unlike on the ground, space uh, in space uh, in in the space, uh, radiation causes semiconductor. Uh, uh, misoperation, which is a uh, 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 serious issues. Uh, through <coughs> the joint work uh, with uh, JAXA, we have discovered uh, that spintron semiconductors are more tolerant uh, against uh, the radiation than existing semiconductors. Now we have uh, completed uh, the testing on the ground. We are aiming for the demonstration in space. In this way, we believe uh, the application is. Uh, wide ranging. Uh, lastly, I'd like to share the national project, uh, which is uh, currently under underway. I think uh, this is the first project uh, related to the semiconductor buys and uh, mixed, uh, mixed elementary of education, culture and sports and science and technology in a long time. And uh, we believe that uh, it is probably the first 10 years project uh, for semiconductors. Now, uh, we have uh, uh, 38 uh, institutions uh, involved in this project. Uh, this project uh, is characterized by uh, uh, creating 
new material and new uh, devices that uh, bring about an innovation in uh, a semiconductor using spin tunnel semiconductor as core technology. And uh, through the, this activity to demonstrate them the integrated circuit level. Also, uh, through this uh, R&D work uh, to develop the highly skilled uh, human resources who will be responsible for these activities. Also, uh, it is only in our secondary, we have already uh, shown uh, at the NAWA result, which is a paper has been accepted at the top conference uh, in the semiconductor device field. In terms of the human resource development, uh, the project has launched in the uh, own uh, research assistant system. Uh, we have already hired 40 students and in progress of making a lecture by participating <laughs> company. Uh, which will be open in the future. Now we will develop uh, to continue to develop the spin to the semiconductors as a game changer technology and uh, at least a social uh, issue listed here. Uh, finally, uh, let me show the uh, let me show the the message from uh, the director of this center, Professor Endo, and. Uh, I'd like to conclude my presentation and thank you for your attention. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for outlining the uh, consortium and uh, how the work is actually conducted at your institute. Uh, Spintronics is uh, widely interesting and I'm sure that our audience has lots of takeaways from the presentations uh, so far. We are about to enter the Q&A, so you must have seen my message in the uh, chat box. Now oh. is the time to get your questions answered. So those of you who have any queries, please type them up in the Q&A box, and um, we will have one of our speakers uh, reply to you in real time. Yeah, the question goes, any thoughts uh, on semiconductor manufacturing equipment? And the question goes to. Uh, I used to work for a semiconductor, a Japanese semiconductor equipment company, one of the biggest, Tokyo Electron. And after joining IT Bombay, I've been working with applied materials. So, uh, extremely, extremely important part of uh, the ecosystem. And uh, Gianluca mentioned about choke points. Equipment is a major choke point, especially as you go to uh, more sophisticated technologies. So uh, nothing happens without that. And let me uh, quickly share the uh, what we know of what Applied Materials is doing, right, because it's instructive as a whole for the ecosystem. As I said, in India, they are contributing to the ecosystem by growing a whole uh, uh, supplier base around their development center. In the US, uh, with the US Chips Act, they have proposed to have a state-of-the-art development center with their customers, which are the Intels and the Samsungs and the TSMCs. So the equipment companies actually can play a, the role of a, of a glue, tying in you know, the chemicals, uh, chemical supplier and the, all the rest with the chip makers. So I don't know if that answers the question, but hopefully answer. Thank you again for answering the question. And the next one goes to Professor Uedono. You introduced three steps to revitalize Japan's semiconductor, but why has Japan's semiconductor industry lost its competitiveness in the first place? Even if Japan increases production capacity, can it still be price competitive? So this question goes to Professor Uedono. Well, uh, that is a bit difficult question to uh, answer. Well, first, uh, question is why we Japan or Japanese companies uh, lost their share in the semiconductor industry? Well, there is a lot of discussion about it, and uh, there is a multiple uh, reason for that. One of the biggest uh, reason is that uh, failed to change the uh, production system using fab system. So recently, well, around uh, twenty years ago the semiconductor devices are fabricated by FAB, such as TSMC, uh, something like that. And uh, But before 
we noticed that uh, Japanese companies such as Toshiba, NEC, uh, Panasonic, lots of companies uh, want to make their own device by themselves. So that increases the cost very much. And that is uh, one of the big mistakes of Japanese companies. So uh, nowadays, we understand that the fabrication of the semiconductor devices should be uh, performed by global uh, ecosystem, global network. So that is uh, why we are uh, now seeking uh, collaboration between United States, EU, and India. So that is the situation. Thank you for answering the question. So the question that goes to Professor Svarup Ganguly, if um, you could please read it in the Q&A box. You showed the ITB and RISC uh, capacity on R&I four inch wafers. Are there any plans for 200 millimeter and above, which can lead to actual product, product development? Very specific. And now since India and Japan are into a uh, G2G agreement, why not collaborate on MEMS, in which Japan is the best? Also, I would like to know the point of view of Japanese experts on this. A very extensive question. Um, yeah, I'll, so. I'll try to answer very quickly. So uh, we did have 200 millimeter capacity for some time with uh, tools that were donated by applied materials. Uh, it's very, very expensive to for a university to maintain 200 millimeter tools uh, without very significant support coming in. So right now, most of our capacity is four inch, but uh, we have a lot of experience working with the semiconductor lab in, in Chandigarh, which is India's only silicon uh, fab lab today. It was under the Department of Space, now belongs to the Ministry of Electronics, and is set up to be the hub for the India Semiconductor Research Center. So we have done all kinds of experiments with them, developed technologies there, taken wafers from there, and done you know, RAM devices on the back end. Uh, so, so that is certainly there. Uh, in terms of Japan, uh, I am very keen, I am leading a special effort for outreach to Japanese industry. Semiconductors must be a part of that. Uh, uh, we will have to figure out, I can't say that I know where, you know, we will achieve the win-wins where both sides will think this is what we need to work on that will be learning for us. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, that's all I have, you did back to you on this. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, a query from Kobe University, maybe a question for the Japanese audience, although this may also apply to speakers from other countries. With the recent implementation of technology presentations, accepting researchers from abroad in Japan, the quality, the quantity of paperwork has increased quite a bit. I feel this may have a rather chilling effect on international collaboration. As experts in the semiconductor industry, what is your experience? Judith, I can comment on this if, if that's okay. Yes, please. So uh, first off, I think that uh, folks from the first world, of course, don't know the extent of the problem that uh, we face <laughs> when, I mean, in terms of attending conferences and things like that, we meaning we who do not have visa-free uh, business travel, right? In fact, uh, until uh, two years ago, I used to not be able to get a US visa without uh, extensive approval from Washington and all that because this was a sensitive area. Uh, then after COVID and everything else that happened and the spotlight on semiconductors, uh, the whole thing changed on its head. I was with a special invitation. I, I got a 10-year visa uh, to the US. So it, it uh, cut both ways. Uh, I, I think that uh, if one is uh, looking at the most uh, open access, yes, I'm sure that there will be some curtailment there. I see a more focused uh, enablement, personal experience. That's all I have. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we also have a question, actually two questions in the in the chat, unless somebody else would like, yes, uh, uh, Gianluca. Yes, I can further argue on uh... Professor Ganguly uh, answer, as I am uh, researchers mainly focusing on the poly science and economic side of semiconductors, I'm actually not experienced these 
fear of chilling in terms of uh, receiving presentation from sci sci scientists and experts from around the world. I think in, in my in my case, it's the other way around. There is a, a need, a strong need for understanding how this technology export works. And there is a strong need for an uh, expert that can sort of navigate through the complexity of, of the export. But I guess I understand your point and maybe in terms of sharing technology insights that could be a little bit challenging. The two questions actually. Where do you see bottlenecks that are hampering international collaboration? Events like these could help bridge the information gap. And number two, when are we going to see the first smartphones and PCs with Spintronic technology on the market? So uh, okay, we... uh, let me answer the second question first from uh, Tohoku University. Uh, also, uh, it uh, uh, might be difficult to say the uh, exact uh, when. Uh, but a major semiconductor foundry has uh, already launched risk mass production of MRAM using spintronics. I expect, uh, well, mm, mm, maybe next uh, five or ten years. Anyone care to share a few thoughts about where do you see the bottlenecks that are hampering international collaborations? Some of you are actually touched on this uh, question. Uh, Professor Uadono extensively uh, talked about, you know, what could be success stories and what could be the actual challenges. Actually, there is no large bottlenecks. For example, uh, each uh, university, for example, Tsubai University, uh, we have, uh, say, 370 partners all over the world. They have a strong connection to Tsukuba University, and we are collaborating with each other. Uh, exchanging uh, students, exchanging uh, credits, uh, exchanging uh, lecture, and also students and uh, researchers. But, uh, you know, the relationship between uh, universities are a little bit slow, com considering the very high speed of the research of the semiconductor device. So we have to hurry up. So that is the speed is the only the bottleneck, I believe. Further argue on Professor Akira Wedono. I would say the only bottlenecks I am recording is at the political level. So politics that are not making the case for people uh, for collaboration and scientific collaboration between experts. But university, I think, are eager to understand each other processes and uh, the uh, advancement of research. They are going here research. So it, it should be that the only understandable bottlenecks i think i believe it's at the political level between between countries and related alliances they are uh, building so far uh, i think i have one comment about this yes you're right we university uh, should not have such kind of political barrier of course however uh, in the case of the technology development in the case of semiconductor technology developments with Tsukuba University or another university have to work with other national research facilities, not the university, national research university. Mm -hmm. And those national universities are running by government and closely related to the government, government opinions. So the, unfortunately, because of the uh, very uh, severe relationship between United States and China, for example. So the collaboration with specific countries a uh, little bit uh, difficult at this stage. You know, the university want to collaborate without political barrier, but the uh, university have to work with national research facilities. National research facility has a barrier. So because this affect the behavior of Tsukuba University itself. So that is uh, one of the problem for us. We still have a little bit of time, so let me read the next question. Professor Ganguly, is India investing enough to create ecosystems and develop DUV or um, EUV FAP systems? So the quick answer to that would be no. Uh, this is probably the uh, one of the most expensive things to invest into. And uh, uh, you can understand that, uh, you know, 
policymakers in India have known for decades that this is something that we should get into, but it has gone progressively more expensive to get into it. So they have to always look for the shallow end of the swimming pool to jump into, and that's the deep end. So that's not going to be one of the first things I think that's taken up. Now back to you. Okay, with all the challenges, thank you so much. We discussed cooperation among the three regions, but I still think that China's presence is important as a manufacturer and a consumer. How should we deal with China's semiconductor industry while also taking economic security into account? Well, I think I can address this question uh, since I have mentioned China in my presentation and I am studying and researching on China since the beginning of my uh, research career, I would say. The risking from all around the world is a risky game, in my opinion. Uh, and from the European Union perspective, that got stuck in the middle of this chip war be between giants in terms of semiconductor uh, innovation capacity, but also production and manufacturing processes and know-how. Uh, the European Union should, as I said, on one side, bolstering the economic security goal, but also trying to maintaining the its economy open in order to gaining to gain benefits from R and D multi transfer in, between countries, and it's the only way to do that with in the case of China is engaging with countries like China in what in those sectors that are indispensable for Europe. It's sort of playing the game that should best serve the European interest in terms of it, instead of uh, focusing on the on the threat of Chinese uh, on the Chinese companies of Chinese government. So the European Union should get smarter in terms of engaging instead of the risking with China, but engaging with China in those sectors that are indispensable for its own technological advancement. Thank you very much for the response and I'm afraid that's all we've had time for. I would like to ask our next speaker, uh, Perik Fion Ashida, who is to give the closing speech. Uh, he's first consular head of R&I section at the delegation of the European Union to India. Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. I am a head of uh, innovation at the EU delegation to India. I work for the headquarters of the EU in India, representing research and innovation cooperation with India. But before I was doing the same job, uh, in uh, delegation in Japan, and I have a, a professional industry experience working for Hitachi Group in Japan and uh, in uh, European industry in Europe. I will be uh, uh, presenting maybe two, three ideas only, and I will not speak about uh, semiconductors, I will speak about uh, advanced materials because I want to have a broader message. Um, I hope, so. yes, you can make a view of, uh, of the few slides. Uh, yes, so advanced material is something that I want to talk about because it's very timely for the EU. I'm not a specialist of semiconductors, of course I am an engineer, so I know what is uh, silicium, uh, germanium, gallium, arsenide, but here I want to explain more the geopolitics behind advanced materials. Advanced materials is essential. We were speaking last just now about uh, ge uh, geopolitics competitive issues. The EU is looking at industrial leadership. It wants to, I don't like the word regain, but it wants as any other nation is, uh, in the world to be independent and to decide on its own strategy. Uh, and that's why precisely uh, linked to advanced material, there will be a communication of the EU by the end of this year uh, you had in the slide before some uh, web links, but it's just to flag that this domain of advanced materials, which is not only semiconductors, semiconductors is one type of uh, advanced materials, is essential. And we realized so uh, when we were moving in the EU uh, uh, to the green transition, because the green transition is essentially an energy transition. Uh, it means you have to reduce the use of materials, whatever sector it is, from construction to health sector, to uh, uh, aerospace, uh, to electronic ve electric vehicles. Uh, you need absolutely to develop technologies and you need partnerships as well. This is an interesting slide. It's about the Green Deal. You probably heard about it, so I will not go through that slide. 
but it's just to explain it's an interesting uh, and you will have the slide but yeah the organizer an extremely interesting way to look at the different uh, economic sector and what where are the technologies behind uh, here we are not only speaking about semiconductors we speak about graphene we speak about uh, biopolymers biomaterials in all the sectors it's the same we must invest in research we must invest in innovation and we must invest i heard it was important we must invest uh, from professor we don't know and others but we must invest in the mobility of students uh, at all level from master from a phd and postdocs absolutely because uh, not only one single part of the world as a know-how and it's only by having the people of, of, uh, moving around uh, like uh, Dr. Swarupu who I was impressed to work here uh, with Japanese uh, company in Europe but he's from India so this is exactly uh, much needed I wanted to give that example of uh, probably many of you know the MGI materials genome initiative it's extremely interesting because it's as, as usual the typical American approach the man on the moon so they are able to decide, but similarly so for the EU, we are able to decide uh, on uh, ground uh, challenges. Uh, the EU has, and I, I will not advertise it today, but has an extremely large Horizon Europe research program that is open to the world. And similarly on, on, uh, on biomaterials, uh, like uh, from the Genome Initiative, will come a lot of research that must be addressed uh, at a global level. Uh, when we look at advanced materials, especially in your sector of semiconductors, uh, we absolutely need to look at patenting uh, because it's a way to protect knowledge. It's not that you uh, build a wall, but to protect knowledge is also to share knowledge and to be accountable to who finds it and who funds it. To find and to fund is different. Uh, and so that's why those agreements are absolutely necessary. I just remind you the role of Europe here. Uh, the Europe accounts for 15% in advanced materials. Uh, we could look at the details for semiconductors. Japan is extremely well placed and, 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 and India is coming up very rapidly. Uh, we need to look at also uh, the domain of innovation and uh, uh, Dr. Vanguli uh, 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 was mentioning this for India. Here, uh, this is also like the one on Green Deal a slide that you have to go uh, through individually, uh, but it's where are the sectors of patent where the EU uh, is still strong and where there is a race, obviously, uh, with uh, other um, country partners. Uh, it's uh, very important to, to look at this slide. I have only two last slides, and uh, Professor Ganguly from, uh, from India, from uh, IIT Mumbai, was explaining. I will be very broad because I am not focusing on semiconductors. I am speaking about advanced material. I, I just want to link to what's going on uh, in India. India is advancing extremely rapidly in domain of like uh, nanotechnologies. They have developed a nano mission, which is not under the MEYT, uh, the Ministry of Telecom equivalent, but it's under the Ministry of Research with the DST, Department of Science and Technology. And equally, uh, India is investing a lot on clean and energy materials. So very rapidly, because the, the number of uh, students, PhDs uh, is large in India, uh, we will see progress. So the U Europe is looking at this, and I have my last, this is something that I will be brief, but extremely important. Uh, and actually it's my colleague who we speak after, Peter Fatelnik, who is based in Tokyo, who is uh, uh, more looking at the issues from, uh, because he belongs to the Ministry of Equivalent Telecom at the EU delegation in Tokyo. But this is something that where we are looking at, at in uh, the EU with India right now uh, via what we call the Trade and Technology Council. The EU has set last May at the level of ministers in India and the commissioners in the EU at strategic technologies in the domain of digital. And this is the last slide, but it is precisely about that Trade and Technology Council because there is here uh, microelectronic and supply chain uh, uh, MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, that is going to be signed very, very rapidly. Uh, and just to tell you, it's very likely to happen still this week. 
So this is extremely important uh, for industry. And we need, when the EU is progressing abroad, we need to invest in a co-led uh, research programs. I was mentioning what the DBT, uh, sorry, the DST, Department of Science of Technology is doing. But also we need to bring industry. I have heard throughout the presentations about the role of innovators, the startups, SMEs. Uh, so the EU, my office in India, is precisely responsible for setting the scene and helping companies both ways. It's not only from Europe to, to India, it's also from India to Europe. And similarly, we do have such uh, uh, agreements between Japan and the uh, and, uh, EU. So I believe that Peter, who speaks just after me now, uh, will mention this. So I want to just on this last slide to give you again my contact details. Uh, you may uh, send me an email. Uh, yes, correct. It's to get in touch. Uh, as I said, I believe you can close the presentation. I believe that uh, the domain of semiconductors, like for semi uh, uh, advanced materials, needs international cooperation, but at the same time, it's a competitive sector. So we definitely have to compete and to cooperate. Uh, we should absolutely use uh, the mobility schemes that I was mentioning. I am head uh, for India of Erasmus. Erasmus is a uh, scheme for master students. And Marie Sklodowska Career Action is for PhD and postdocs. And it works very well with India uh, because uh, the Indian scientists are interested to come to Europe. They, of course, like to go to the US, like the European, all the European want to go to the US. Uh, but uh, we need to, to privilege these uh, this new people, these new scientists to move around and to work for European companies in Europe or to work for European companies in India, in, in those domains uh, where you are all working. So thank you, Samrat uh, I, and Judith, to have organized this uh, with your access. I think it's a good example of uh, how we should uh, discuss between EU, India and Japan. I am very pleased to pass the floor to my good friend and a colleague, Peter, because we have been working together in the minister, equivalent minister, Ministry of Telecom 20 years ago. Uh, and now we are, he's in Japan, I am in India. Uh, so the floor is yours. Thank you uh, for all the speakers. Uh, uh, I will meet you, Professor Gamburi. I will come to Mumbai very soon. I would like to invite uh, Peter Fatani, the Minister Councillor for Digital Economic Policy at the delegation of the European Union to Japan to deliver his further remarks. Many thanks, many thanks for having me. And I understand yeah. the role of the very, yeah. very, very last speaker on a long agenda is to be brief. So I will try to live up to that expectation. I think that was a fascinating conversation. So many thanks for everybody contributing to that. And, and I hope that the audience have learned something as well. I clearly see now this picture of there is an EU India relationship, and Pierre Filon has been talking about it. There is a Trade and Technology Council where semiconductors play a crucial role. Maybe we see something this week in terms of agreement. We have a similar relationship, EU-Japan, where also there is already a memorandum of understanding on semiconductors in place. We also see an agreement between Japan and India with an agreement from 25th of October this year, just a couple of, of weeks ago. So to a certain extent, I think there is a common understanding. We know what we want. We know how do we want to get there. And I would like to paint a picture which is a bit less competitive and more cooperative and more complementary for the simple reason that we all figured out it's very hard to grow in a growing market. If an example, the European Union would like to grow its market share in terms of production from 10 to 20%. And Professor, uh, Professor Odeno has been showing very nicely this slide where, you know, if you're 10%, you want to double to 20%. That actually means in real production, you have to produce three times because the market grows. And then it depends what numbers you believe between 17 and 12% annually until the end of this decade. So putting three times the production in really on the ground is very hard. It's very hard. I mean, we are all building fabs. We're all doing a lot of work, but that actually may, may not be so easy to achieve. Let me be optimistic, but also we all realize here around the table how difficult it is. But that's exactly the opportunity for cooperation we have. 
we're not necessarily competing with each other every time, all the time, on all the products. No. Uh, there will be some competitive situations, so that's excellent. That's very good, you know. But actually, I think in practice, we'll find each other much more in a collaborative situation and less competitive than, than we think. So that's sort of a little bit the good news. Throwing in some less good news, just uh, not to be too optimistic, is the topic has moved from research, industry, manufacturing, and all of that, also into economic security. Now, that may kind of complicate matters a little bit, or it does already, to be frank. And it may complicate it further, at least speaking for the European Union. We have now started our second assessment of the semiconductor industry in terms of economic risks. I hope by the end of the year we have a result or early next year. But it's safe to assume that the sector will again be one of the core sectors for economic security. We recently highlighted nine other sectors. Quantum is another one, AI is another one, and the usual suspects we all know. So this technology in this industry will continue for under economic security with all the regulations which come with it. That is regulation on end users. This is regulation on the value chain. There will be sort of implications on how we see the trade in those consumables, tools, and end products in this area. Now, um, I, I want to sort of finish maybe with a little bit of an idea. Uh, I think this is also, if we all build out those fabs, those fabs are not just there to manufacture products. They will be innovative. Uh, just for instance, Rapidus is putting on the ground a factory which doesn't exist anywhere in the world. It will be very different technology. So just making something new at that scale is true innovation. Uh, we also have another challenge in the sector, which is greening that sector. It consumes way too much energy, water. It is consuming uh, Pro, uh, uh, consumables which are poisonous to the most extent. So we have to work with the sector as well to achieve our climate targets for this industry. In particular, if it's a growing sector, it's posing a problem. So we have to do more, we have to do it greener, and we have to do it more innovative. So that clearly, clearly asks for cooperation. And what I'm sort of a little bit suggesting or floating here as my final idea is you know, these fabs, they will all serve research purposes, even if they are manufacturing. Now, making a digital twin of that fab may be a very smart idea, not just for the organization running the fab in order to see, you know, what's going on, in order to improve, but it's also to do research on there. And then there is the component whether we should not sort of be able to internationalize some of the research we are able to do on those, on those fabs. A digital twin of a factory, which will help us then to innovate, which will help us to green it, where we can save water, where we can save consumables, how we can recycle better those things, will be a quite an interesting field of research. And I, I'm tempted to bat my left leg that in 10 years from now, there will be digital twins for every factory. There will be companies specializing in providing services on those data you are collecting in those digital twins. So I think there is an area where, which is still far away in terms of products and services where I think we can cooperate. And I guess there are some ideas out there already in the IMAX and, and the Sealetis and our European research environments to work in that direction. With this, I would like here to leave you now at this stage and thank you very much for, for all what I have learned in this conversation. Greatly appreciate, thank you. Thank you very much for the lovely farewell remarks. You basically summarized the entire event and touched upon the most important details. Please follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Line and Facebook or follow us on our, our profile page. Thank you very much for coming and wish you a lovely goodbye.